Gaming has a habit of letting itself settle into a structure, of looking at its past works and thinking that this is what games are supposed to be. Games are supposed to stick to one genre, games are supposed to let you keep whatever progress you've made, games are supposed to leave the barrier between themselves and the player fully intact. And all of this goes double for games in the AAA landscape. However, in that space there are a handful of directors who seek to reject all the things that gaming takes for granted, and push the boundaries of the mechanics and ideas games are allowed to utilize and examine. People like Hideo Kojima and Suda51 are constantly trying to not take games for granted and search for new ways to make games speak to their audience. However, the person who may be the most dedicated to finding and testing the limits of AAA games is a man who has only recently begun to see mainstream success, named Yoko Taro, director of Nier and Drakengard, and the person who more than any other knows that games are capable of great things. Yoko Taro was born in 1970 in the sprawling city of Nagoya, within the Aichi Prefecture. Due to his parents' time-consuming jobs, he spent much of his childhood being raised by his strict yet loving grandmother. During his teen years, Yoko would spend time with various acquaintances that he met in high school. However, one day as he and a collection of friends were hanging out in the shopping district, one of them opted to walk along the edge of a tall building and slipped to his death. The event was initially terrifying to Yoko. However, as he grew past it and moved past the trauma of it, he began to find the humor in it. After all, someone slipping from a building while trying to impress people is, frankly, the kind of setup comedy has been built on. An attempt, followed by total failure. This bleak event, with its mixture of tragic death and comedic circumstance, would inform his approach to writing game scripts for the rest of his career. Upon finishing high school, he would go on to Kobe Design University, where he'd specialize in 3D CGI before graduating in 1994, and while he did not initially plan on going into games, he would find himself acquiring his first post-grad job at Bandai Namco Games. In the short term, he found himself contributing to Alpine Racer 2 and Time Crisis 2 as a background artist before joining Cat a company that would eventually put him at the helm of the game that would both define and begin his career as a director. Drakengard. While originated by Takamasa Shiba and Takuya Owasaki, Yoko quickly found himself at the head of the Dynasty Warrior and Ace Combat mashup due to their preoccupation with other projects. It wasn't long after he took the reins of the project that he began to seek ways to make his game stand out. This was in the early 2000s after all one of, if not the most explosive period for JRPGs. If this new franchise was going to survive amongst the likes of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, it was going to need to offer something that those games didn't have, a voice all its own. As the script was penned, the tone of that voice became clear. It was bleak, alien, and, especially for its time, disturbing. Yoko's directorial debut included, but was not limited to, an incestuous relationship between two of the main characters, the murder and cannibalism of children, and a playable character that is canonically a pedophile. Perhaps most famously, though, is that it was a game that refused to let the thousands of murders committed within the gameplay be viewed as a positive thing. Nearly a decade before Spec Ops The Line and Undertale, the original Drakengard was condemning the normalized violence in games by way of humanizing its victims and portraying the main characters, and by extension the players that engage with it, as shameless, immoral monsters. Not for shock value, but to highlight something he saw as a problem. その時その his characters aren't unhinged for the sake of being edgy or as an attempt to garner attention. They are unhinged because that is the most realistic portrait of the kind of person the default video game protagonist would have to be. 
Yoko rejects the idea that a character who would willfully go through the experience of murdering legions of humans could ever be the kind of person who would be emotionally equipped to simply go back home and live out their days after doing so. And the fact that we go through so many games believing such is just as disturbing as anything he could write. Drakengard would release in Japan in 2003, and for the West in 2004, to a solid, if unenthusiastic, sales as well as a weak critical reception, with numerous criticisms of the combat abound. However, its distinct tone and unique themes led to it building a die-hard cult following that included key people inside of Square Enix and Kavi itself. Despite this, Yoko wasn't brought back to direct the sequel, Drakengard 2, due primarily to his open frustration towards management at being asked to change so much of Drakengard. One. This riff would only widen during development as he would repeatedly come into conflict with director Akira Yasui. He wasn't excluded entirely from the creative process of the second game, but was generally given very little say or authority, and would ultimately be credited only as a video editor. Once Drakengard 2 released though, Yoko Taro would almost immediately set to work crafting the game that would cement his reputation as a director in many gaming circles. Initially conceived as a small-staffed, bare-bones Drakengard 3, Nier was eventually converted into a massive open-world RPG spin-off with the entirety of Kavya working on it, as well as Tekken composer and future series mainstay Keiichi Okabe, while Square Enix provided funding and support in addition to granting Yoko nearly complete creative control. This freedom, largely enabled by producer, Square Enix employee, and fan Yosuke Saito, allowed Yoko Taro to craft a game that was unlike anything else in gaming upon its release. Nier is a game that, while ostensibly an action RPG, is also a shmup. It's also a dungeon crawler and a text adventure, as well as a side-scrolling beat-em-up, a horror game, and Animal Crossing. It's a game that has you play as someone who is both the hero and the villain. And most famously, Nier is a game that asks you to replay it multiple times to better understand the perspectives of everyone else in the world before finally giving up something of your own. All of this can be traced back to his own stated goal of pushing the boundaries of what games are possible of doing. As Yoko himself describes it, there exists our knowledge of what we know that games can do, and things we know they can't. However, somewhere between those two bases of knowledge exist the things that games are capable of doing, but either aren't known or aren't allowed. The barrier between which he calls the invisible wall. As Yoko has explained it in the past, what if we were allowed to make a game that is impossible for a human to finish? Or what if we were allowed to make a multi-million dollar game that only lasted 10 minutes but those were the greatest 10 minutes you could ever experience? What if we were allowed to go into the realm of dangerous, unmapped territory every so often to find out what games are truly capable of? It's worth noting that he doesn't necessarily want to make games with these specific elements, or even think they're good ideas. But he does want to continue leaning on that invisible wall between good and absurd ideas to keep gaming fresh. Yoko's admitted in the past that few games truly excite him anymore. He fully recognizes that there are more well-made games now than ever. However, well-made is a simple baseline, the bare minimum for something to be worthy of being released. What Yoko Taro cares about more than anything are games that make his heart beat, that excite him and leave him guessing not only as to what's going to happen next in the story, but in the gameplay as well. And that is something that has become increasingly rare as the cost of game development has continued to climb. This is what he wants to change more than anything. Nier was his first step down that path. Nier would release in 2010, a full seven years after the original Drakengard, to incredibly divisive reviews and weak sales. In spite of this, it would acquire a cult following that surpassed even Drakengard's, especially in the West, off the back of its brilliant soundtrack, charismatic character writing, and unique gameplay. Unfortunately though, this wouldn't be enough to keep Kavya alive. Two months after the game's release, Kavya was disbanded. The majority of the staff would be absorbed into its parent company, AQ Interactive, while others would find themselves scattered between Tango Gameworks, Comcept, and even FromSoft. However, Yoko ultimately opted to work as a freelancer, or as he would later call it, be unemployed.
Over the next few years, Yoko would find himself working on Square Enix social game Monster X Dragon before directing Enix's game Demon Score. But as luck would have it, Yoko Taro and Drakengard producer Takamasa Shiba would meet up years after Kavya's closure and eventually begin sharing thoughts on what Drakengard 3 would look like. They began to find themselves getting excited about their old plans, and before long, found themselves pitching it to Square Enix, who approved production. The game would ultimately be made by Deadly Premonition developer Axis Games in an attempt to address complaints about Nier and Drakengard's lackluster combat. But despite this renewed focus on core gameplay, it would be the character writing that would take center stage more than anything. The protagonist, Zero, embodies this more than anyone else. At first glance, she appears to be another foul-mouthed young woman, an archetype that Yoko is well known for engaging in. However, she's more brutal than any other Taro character, more impatient and more petty, but also more relatable, more openly sexual, and much more prone to humor. My name is Zero, the original intoner, and the immortal... <laughs> Knock it off! I'm trying to make a speech here! Now... Uh, oh, for fuck's sake! Now I lost my place! This also stands true for the rest of the game. Dragon Guard 3 maintains the same dark tone of its predecessor while also bringing in a good helping of comedy to keep it from being one note, while also seeking to make each character stand out with strong personalities. However, what hasn't changed is the strength of each character's arc, and the power with which they are told and conclude. The main reason for this is Yoko's non-traditional writing style. He stated that he doesn't understand standard script writing conventions that they feel restrictive and arbitrary. This led him to coming up with his own style of writing, where he opts to begin writing at the conclusion of the storyline and, after choosing the kind of emotional peak he wants, finally writing backwards to the beginning to figure out what caused that emotional peak, a technique that he appropriately calls backwards writing. It's in this way that he's able to make his conclusions hit home because every plot choice was made in service to that conclusion, and that's what makes his plots as powerful as they are. Dragon Guard 3 was released in 2013 for Japan and 2014 worldwide, and much like its predecessor, was met again with extremely divisive critical reception, solid but not stellar sales, and a die-hard cult following. After its release, Yoko would find himself once again unemployed. However, behind the scenes, something was beginning to come together. Near producer Yosuke Saito respected the original game's vision and believed in Yoko Taro's talents. As such, he'd been doing his best to pull strings to get a sequel since Nier's release. The idea was initially shot down due to Nier's lackluster sales and reception. But as time passed, the game's growing legacy and fanbase enabled Saito to get Square Enix and ex Nier staff to reconsider the series' future. It was only about a year after Dragon Guard 3's release before Yoko found himself working on an unexpected new entry into near. But if they were going to develop a sequel, they weren't going to repeat the mistakes of the original. They looked at the negative feedback they'd received from both critics and fans, and decided to resolve the most popular complaint first. The combat. However, Square Enix knew well enough that they didn't have the expertise on hand to make the combat system into what they knew it could be. Instead, they'd have to go outside the company. Square Enix contacted Bayonetta developer Platinum Games, and sought a collaboration on two conditions that Yoko Taro would be the game's director, and that he would help out with production in person. Platinum agreed. This required Yoko to relocate from Tokyo to Osaka, where Platinum Games is based, a move that Yoko was initially skeptical about. But after meeting with the Platinum team, he realized many of them were fans of him, especially the younger members, and had been wanting to work with him for quite a while. They reassured him that they were just as eager to stay true to the original game as he was. Nier Automata would be released in 2017 and immediately be greeted by strong praise from critics and fans alike before going on to sell a million copies in its first month. In addition, due in large part to his out-of-place E3 appearance, eccentric interviews, and humorous promotional videos, Yoko Taro's name began to reach into the mainstream. And frankly, it couldn't have happened at a better time. Nier Automata stands as his most complete and polished game to date. 
With a rich combat system, an incredible breadth of gameplay choices, and the strongest cast of characters he's ever crafted. It's his most diverse and creative work yet, seamlessly blending intricate action gameplay, third-person shooting, full-on bullet hell sections, twin-stick shooting, 2D brawling, open-world exploration, Dark Souls-esque death and online mechanics, some brutal fourth wall breaks, and so much more all while journeying through a story riddled with Socratic exercises, reflections on what it means to be a being with consciousness, and examinations about what games themselves even are and what they could be. All of these elements come back to Yoko's primary goal. For him, when it comes to game design, crafting quality gameplay or writing isn't his objective. Instead, Yoko's goal is to communicate with the player and share his thoughts, feelings, and values with them. Perhaps the most telling moment is one where the game itself asks you the question, clearly and directly, do you think games are silly little things? It's a question designed to simultaneously make the player confront what it is they really think games are, while letting Yoko Taro himself make it perfectly clear that he thinks games are monumentally important and have an unbelievable amount of potential. It's a question from a man who wants both his audience and industry to take games as seriously as he does, and to not allow games to just become a disposable toy to be absentmindedly played through once and then immediately forgotten upon completion. This is why he wants to break the invisible wall. To keep games growing, to keep them exciting and memorable, and to propel them into the status of high art that he knows they could occupy if we tried. Games are far too important to let anything else happen. There are hundreds of directors working in the AAA industry right now, but potentially no one else in that scene is as eager and dedicated as Yoko to pushing games forward. His eagerness to tackle the taboo, to innovate in truly and completely original ways, and to call out his own audience for not being as demanding as he is for these things, is more than anything what makes him an amazing director. He believes that games can change the world, and it's this idea that he desperately wants to pass on to the next generation of designers and audience members alike. If there's anything we can learn from Yoko Taro, it's that we shouldn't ever take any idea or rule for granted. We must always be challenging every preconceived notion we have, because that is the only way we move forward as artists, as consumers, as people, and make life exciting. Art is so dynamic and so continually unchartered that it's almost irresponsible of us not to try and push through those boundaries, to break through the invisible wall and do things that you aren't supposed to do. Without approaches like that, we don't get the kinks slicing into amps with a knife to invent punk rock. We don't get zombies in Night of the Living Dead, and we don't get the impactful experience of literally viewing the world from a new perspective that Nier gave us. None of his games may be perfect, but a lack of perfection is the price we pay when we attempt something new. We should all strive to be like Yoko Taro, because it's people like him that allowed art and culture to grow, and part of what made our world what it is today. Show.